Hello everyone. Uh, I will ask just an additional minute to explain why I'm presenting now. So I was not supposed to present this paper in this conference. So uh, <laughs> what happened is that uh, a lot of people couldn't come for the conference for different reasons. So Ale, that was supposed to present now, uh, he kindly agreed to move his presentation to Friday for another session. And I jump in uh, during the breakfast today <laughs> to present. So I'm we uh, apologize because this is a presentation for 45 minutes and I just jumped some slides because I couldn't prepare a presentation uh, because I, we just decided that during the breakfast, <laughs> okay? And this is, this happened when you work in the organization that <laughs> is part of the, con the conference. So, uh, yeah, so the, this uh, paper, the title is The Impact of Studying Abroad, uh, Evidence from a Massive Government Sp Sponsored uh, Scholarship Program in Brazil is a paper uh, joined with uh, Otavio and André, both from Getulio Vargas Foundation, uh, and I'm Rodrigo from Unwider. So basically, uh, uh, it's, it's a really easy paper to motivate for European audience, and I present two times already for the European audience, and I basically say, you know that mobility is important because uh, probably you were an Erasmus student. So most of Europeans in Europe, uh, that study in European universities, uh, at some point they were benefited uh, from Erasmus program. And mobility has a lot of benefits for students. Has the benefit of learning different cultures, uh, learning languages, uh, increases the cultural perspective, uh, learning different kind of labor markets, etc. And this can be even more important for developing countries, considering that. Uh, those countries ha have lower level of investments in education and science. And even though um, many developing countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Saudi Arabia, China have some kind of international mobility programs, there are no evidence of the impact of this program. In fact, even the evidence for developed countries, for European countries for example, is very scarce and they will talk about that. So. Uh, just a summary of the paper. So we basically estimate of uh, the impact of this program that's called Science Without Borders in Brazil, or Ciencias Sin Fronteiras in Portuguese, uh, on enrollment on master's and PhD programs in Brazil, formal employment, wage, and entrepreneurship. Um, the contribution of the paper, first, this is the first paper to estimate causal effects of study abroad programs in the developing country. Uh, we also add to a few pool of papers estimating causal effects of those programs. Um, and I will try to convince you that we are the first paper to estimate the effect on those outcomes, even for developed countries. So there is no evidence, of, even for Erasmus. Um, we build a novel data set by merging 17 public and non-public administrative data sets. And I will explain how we did that. And we are proposing an EUIV uh, strategy here. So, surprisingly, we find that the program had a negative effect on uh, probability of uh, enrollment on post-graduation and on having a formal job and no impact on wages and entrepreneurship. Um, and we will try to explain uh, why this happened and we can show some evidence of delayed graduation and a lower probability of uh, brain drain. Okay. So, uh, the literature, as, as I said, uh, is very scarce, the evidence of uh, study abroad programs. Um, the exception is this paper published in uh, age, age 8, 2011, um, and they study basically the impact of Erasmus on international mobility. So the question is basically, if a student from Finland go to Germany, they stay in Germany or not? Um, and then after this paper, more three papers uh, did the same identification strategy, uh, looking to different countries, also in Europe. And they basically use uh, IV that is uh, quite simple, that is if the student is in a university that was exposed to Erasmus in the past. So for example, if I'm studying in a university that some students before me uh, went to receive a, a scholarship from Erasmus before. But 
these four papers that try to provide some causal estimates, they uh, use movers against non-movers and survey data. So they can only observe from the, the universe of students those that were Erasmus students and those that were not. In our case, we will look to our students that applied to a program and compare who, uh, who win and who, who didn't win the scholarship. Okay, so uh, part of the selection into the program is already corrected because of our data set. So um, the program was created in 2011. The goal was to send students uh, for six to 12 months uh, for some uh, university abroad, mainly US, Europe, and Australia. Focus on undergraduate. So in five years, the program had 73,000 scholarships. To put this in perspective, uh, between 87 and 2000, the same institutions that organized this program, they offered 13,000 scholarships between undergrad, PhD, and postdoc. Um, so the Minister of Science Education was responsible for the selected the scholarships, recipients, priority areas, and the priority areas were, were basically uh, engineering, math, uh, statistics, so technology related areas. Um, more about the program. The program was huge. Uh, so basically, every student received a monthly stipend. The average uh, monthly stipend was 1,200 euros. Sorry, 1,200 dollars. So it's quite a lot of money for 18. 19-year-old student to go to Portugal, for example, or Hungary, for example. Um, plus, airfare, housing allowance, health insurance, installation AD, and AD for educational material. So it was a lot of money spent in this program. Uh, the cost of the program was $2.72 billion. As a comparison, Erasmus, for all European countries, spent $14 billion between uh, 14 and 20. So you see how expensive this program was. More about how the program was expensive, uh, the program was five times the average expenditure uh, necessary to maintain a student in a public university during one year. Or I think this is the best comparison on how the program was expensive, is the same cost uh, of a school meal program that exists in Brazil and attains 39 million children, okay? Um, this is some graphs uh, from a uh, researcher in Brazil called Fernanda de Negri, uh, basically showing that um, the increase of spending uh, in science and technology in Brazil between 2011 and 2015, of course, this is not everything science without borders, but when we look to the data of scholarships for undergrad in Brazil, we can see this. And this is science without borders, okay? So, how we did that? How many minutes do I have? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, how we did that? First, we build this data set. This data is not public, so we need to get this somehow. First, we request to the Minister of Education, to these two institutions, the, the information of all candidates that applied and the candidates who were approved for each call of the program. And there was, I will explain what was uh, this call. And they provide us part of the Brazilian social security number. So uh, the Brazilian social security number has 11 numbers. They provide the six intermediate uh, digits plus the complete names. So after we, have, we had this, this main data set, we needed to get the data from the universities. So Brazil has 69 uh, public federal universities. And the Ministry of Education, uh, it's very difficult to get the data for those uh, who still know much more than me, that's how difficult it is. So we, uh, in Brazil, there is this uh, information access law. I think this is the translation. So you can send a formal request, request to the Brazilian government, government and request some information, whatever information you want, and each uh, institution can decide if they give you the information or not. So from the 69 universities that we send the formal request, we send one request to each university, um, 13 universities reply and provide information. So we cover 20% of the 
of the sample. Or 20% of the universities and 20% of the applicants, we uh, managed to get uh, basically socioeconomic information and other academic information that we need to the to the to our identification strategy and mainly the entrance exam score. So to enter in a Brazilian university, you need to do what we call vestibular. It's an entry, entry exam. It's a national exam. So and this is very really important for our identif identification strategy and the universities that provided this information. Okay. Then we have the formal labor market in Brazil that we can follow st uh, students uh, uh, in the labor market. And these two data sets are public. You can basically uh, go online and, and, and match, uh, but you can match, you, uh, merge using the, using the complete names and the, the six numbers from the social security number. Uh, plus, for one specific university, we have uh, detailed data, so we use these to explore the mechanism in our study. So this is there's a geographical representation. So we cover all macro regions in Brazil, almost all states. So we have a very good dispersion of uh, universities. This is to show basically the candidates. So we have different majors, and uh, the sample for majors vary a lot from different universities. Uh, I'll jump that because of time. So empirical strategy. So we basically estimate an IV and we control for the entrance exam score. This entrance exam score is a measure of uh, previous ability. So it has a bit of uh, an observed ability, has a bit of preparation, has a bit of socioeconomic status, um, family background, etc. We have uh, gender, uh, we have uh, a dam to, because some students, they, they have more than one the, the one major, for example, I did ex, um, economics in 2011, then I did, I don't know, uh, math in 2018. So we just put this. Um, then we have admission year fixed effect, major fixed effect, university fixed effect, and the call fixed effect. The standard errors are closer at the call level, and I will explain what the, this call is, because this is important to explain how we will create a, a IV for this uh, approved variable. Okay, so the program had many calls. How these calls were organized, and this is very important for our IV here. So the, the government come here, 2011, and decide, I'm in launch, launching a call now. The call was for, I don't know, US, and students could apply. But students didn't know how many slots were available. The students didn't know the universities they could go if they were approved. And the students didn't know if there would be more calls. More calls in the program and more calls for the same country. So in this call here, the second call for the program, no one knew if there would be more calls. Only the program implementers. There was no schedule. And we can talk about how the program was created later and was not following the best practice of monitoring and evaluation. So basically, the students couldn't predict if there would be more calls for the country they want to go, and if the call was competitive or not, because they didn't know how many people would apply, and they didn't know how many slots were available for that call. <laughs> okay? Uh, so how the program did the selection? First, the program uh, launched a call, the students apply in their university, and then each university selects the pool of students to send to the Minister of Education and the uh, Minister of Science. Uh, and they, in the university they apply was basically the decision was based on their, their GPA at the moment of the course. Okay? And, uh, um, but the, the universities did have a rule, so they could send everyone that applied. Or they could send uh, 50% or 10%. Each university could decide how many students they would send to the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Science and Technology. Then, when they received all the candidates, they selected students based on the entrance exam score. And these students could not manipulate because they did this exam score two years before, one year before, three years before. Okay. 
But I know that everyone's thinking that I, we are estimating on why you don't estimate a regression discontinuous to design, because you know that they are select through the entrance exam score. Because um, for some reason, the Ministry of Education did provide us the score of the last student in each call, and because we don't have the, uh, data for 69 universities, we only have for 13, okay? If we had for everyone, we could do that. So what we do is a kind of uh, leaving one out, but if, instead of leaving one out, we leave 13 out, 13 universities. And the hypothesis here is pretty simple. If one call is more competitive for all universities, when I exclude the 13 universities in my sample, this call will be also more competitive for any university in any of these 13 universities, okay? So what I'm saying is, Rodrigo is in my sample, um, and Ale is not in my sample, because Ale is in this 57 universities that they don't have information. But they have information about all students that apply and all students that were approved. So what, I, what we did was basically, if this, the call Ale applied is more competitive for, for Ale, with, and I also applied for this call, this call will be also comp more competitive for me, okay? And then uh, we show that uh, there is variability in the call approval distribution, blah, blah, blah. We show that the first stage works. Um, we show different specifications in the appendix. Um, and then we go to the results. So basically we show that the program has a negative probability. Uh, the impact of the program is the students uh, are less likely to, be, to enroll in the post-graduation program in Brazil. Um, we also find that students are less likely to be found in the, label, in the formal labor market. Um, when we look to other labor markets outcomes, we basically show a negative effect on job tenure, and this is really related to the mechanism that I will show in some minutes. But, and we don't find effects on entrepreneurship, um, and these, these are the main results. So the program had a negative effect on um, enrolling in a post-graduation program in Brazil and having a formal contract in Brazil. And those were the main goals of the program, increasing the enrollment of students in Brazilian post-graduation programs and increasing uh, workers uh, with higher skills in Brazilian firms, okay? So, as I mentioned, we have only for one university uh, detailed records for students. We have all the students' history for one university. What we do, we try to understand what is happening. So, when we look to uh, graduation, we observe that those students, they do graduate more, but they do take more time to graduate. So there is a delayed graduation here. And there is uh, enough evidence that taking more time to enter in the labor market in developing countries can have negative results uh, in labor market outcomes in the future, okay? Um, besides that, so I, this, this is more evidence to show that approved students take more time to graduate uh, than not approved students. And besides that, it seems that there was some kind of unluck uh, because of economic, macroeconomic issues. So when we just plot the the, we plotted this graph, but in, in bars, with the GDP variation in Brazil and, and in by a state, from, that is the state this university is based in, we observe that students approved, they graduate during a recession. And there is also enough evidence, enough literature, that shows that graduation during a recession can have a negative effect on uh, the labor market, okay? Finally, I know that everyone is thinking, okay, what if students stay abroad, okay? So, we managed to find 64% of the, of the approved candidates 
uh, in any of the data. So the question is, what are the other 36 percent? If we look to the, 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 this university specifically, it's called Federal University of Bahia data, we can observe here that 20 percent of the students did not graduate until December of 2021. So for this university specifically, 20% of the students did not graduate. So they are still studying. Okay? And why is it reasonable to expect that they are in Brazil? Because you needed to come back to Brazil. So if you, if you went abroad for one year, you necessarily need to come back to Brazil and stay in Brazil for one year. This is one of the, the rules of the program. If you didn't stay in Brazil for one year, you need to Give the, to give the money back to the government. And it also makes sense that students will come back and finish the undergrad first and then go abroad because they would basically lost all the, the two, three years of undergrad they already had uh, before they, they, they leave the country. So 36%, right? So they can be finish the undergrad. I know that UFBA is 20%. Uh, they can be unemployed and looking for something or they can be unemployed by choice, and of course, they can be abroad, okay? Um, so, however, there are mobility constraints to Brazilians. Why? Brazilians do not have work permit in Europe, US, or Australia. Also, there is a cost to go abroad. It's expensive to apply for a visa, to get a job, to rent a house, etc. Also, Brazilian need to pay high fees for post-graduation programs uh, in Europe, and there is no student loan in Brazil. Okay, um, but you can still say, okay, Rodrigo, but there is there is still can be some students abroad that, um, and this could be driving your results, etc. What we are doing now is basically. We are doing a scrapping on LinkedIn and try to find these students on LinkedIn, these 36% students, because uh, basically there is no data to find those students if they went abroad or not. Okay, thank you.